Inner City 125, Britain's fastest diesel-powered high-speed train that ran from the 1970s to 2019. As the name suggests, it could hit 125 miles an hour rather easily. The Mark III coaches that make up the train were of a new design never seen before on British Rail. But how would the train fare up to the ultimate test in a collision? September 19, 1997. The 1032 high-speed train service left Swaznia driven by James Tunnock. He had dr earlier driven the same train under head code 1B08 as the 7 o'clock Paddington to Swaznia service. He now drove in reverse formation as 1A47 to Cardiff Central, where he was to be relieved by Larry Hampson. The train was formed by Power Car 43173, 8 Mark III coaches, and Power Car 43163. The coaches in question were two first class cars at the London end, H and G, followed by the Buffet coach, F, and four standard class coaches, E, C, B, and A, at the rear. 212 passengers were on board. Further down the line, English, Welsh, and Scottish railway freight train 6V17 is on its way to South Hall Yard to drop off its empty hoppers, led by Hansing Class 59 locomotive 59101, crewed by driver Alan Bricker. The freight train was coming from London on the down relief line toward the north side and had been signaled to cross the main line at South Hall East Junction on its way into South Hall Yard on the south side. As the track straightened ahead of the high-speed train, the driver who was gathering his belongings saw the Class 59 moving at a funny angle and realized that it was actually crossing his path on the up line in front of him. The driver of the freight locomotive observed the approaching high-speed train and expected it to stop, but was alarmed at its speed and apparent brake application. He tried to accelerate his train out of the path of the high-speed train, but nothing could be done to prevent disaster. trains collide at 1320. Power car 43173 sideswipes the hoppers and the first coach falls onto its side while the second collided head on with a hopper and both were thrown upward causing the hopper to barely miss the first coach while the second coach bent from the force like a piece of pasta. Six people died instantly in the collision, and one would later die in hospital later on. 139 sustained injuries, and 66 people were unhurt. The Health and Safety Commission found various factors led to the disaster. First off, the Inner City 125 set in question had two faults. The first fault, which was a largely matter of inconvenience, was that the driver guard communication buzzer was not functioning correctly. In Power Car 43173, the buzzer was sounding continuously, but in Power Car 43163, it was simply not operational. The result was that the guard could not give the driver two buzzes to signify that the train was ready to depart. Instead, the train had to proceed under the right-of-way system whereby platform staff either illuminate an indicator for the driver to depart or pass the guard's signal to the driver. This evidently came to the attention of staff on Reading Station, the first stop, and a message was passed ahead so that all stations that the set would be stopping at were aware and could make the necessary arrangements to dispatch the train. The second fault was a lot more serious. The automatic warning system, or AWS, was faulty in Power Car 43173. AWS is a system that was gradually introduced from about 1958, nicknamed the Sunflower Dial by British Rail Engineers, 
Drivers are presented with an audible and visual warning in advance of every signal on the line being traveled. In addition to equipment located in the power car, the track has a ram containing magnets located 200 yards in advance of each signal. As the train passes over the ramp, it receives a magnetic indication of the aspect of the signal which activates warnings in the cab. For a green aspect, a bell rings. Any other signal aspect causes a horn to sound in the cab. An important part of the system is that the driver must acknowledge the horn by pressing and releasing a reset button in the cab. This also has the effect of turning the visual indicator into a black and yellow sunflower pattern, hence the nickname. The most significant part of the warning system is that failure to acknowledge the horn results in automatic emergency brake application. It works kind of similar to cab signals in the United States and positive train control. In order to not have the brakes continuously locking on, the system was isolated, in other words disabled. It was working fine in power car 43163, however. Driver Tunnock knew of both faults and reported them. Driver Harrison was also aware of the faults, however, he had not previously driven a high-speed train without AWS operational. Little attention had been given to the consequences of driving with AWS isolated, and neither driver Harrison nor any other Great Western driver had received any training or instruction on how to drive a 125 set without AWS. In 1997, there were different views within the railway industry as to whether AWS was merely an aid to driving, which would depend on the skill of the driver himself, or whether it should be regarded as an essential safety device. However, both drivers were qualified to drive without it, as both power cars had the driver's safety device, or DSD, which requires the foot pedal to be kept depressed. The pedal was also fitted with the driver's vigilant device, or DVD. This emits a warbling sound approximately every minute, which has to be cancelled by the driver releasing and depressing the pedal within three seconds, in default of which there would be a brake application. The DVD was working in both power cars. At the time of the crash, the junction was protected by three signals. The first signal, SN280, was set at double yellow. The next one, SN270, was at yellow, and the final one, SN254, was at red. No relevant fault was found to exist in both the track and the signals leading up to the crash site, as the signals were all easily visible. The EWS freight train was proceeding across the up and down main lines under the control of the signals as the high speed train approached. The high speed train driver, Larry Harrison, failed to heed either of the warning signals, SN280 or 270, but he did break on seeing SN254 at red, but the trains were still traveling at relative speeds in excess of 80 miles an hour when the collision occurred. So. Why did the driver react so late? Well, the driver, Larry Harrison, remembers saying that he was putting his items in his bag before the incident happened. There was a taped recorded conversation with him and a signaler at the nearest trackside telephone. This was the conversation. Uh, I'm okay, yeah. I was just putting my stuff away in the bag. The A... The A... The, the AWS had been isolated because some... some brake problem, I believe, so... I'd no AWS, so... I, I put me stuff away in the bag, and the next thing I knew, I was coming up against red, up such... coming through... through... through South Hall, yeah. I was just putting me stuff away in the bag, like I would normally do, you see? Right. And all of a sudden, I was whizzing through haze with a red at South Hall. Right. I see the slow train crossing over then. He did not see the preceding signals. Functioning automatic warning system would have given him an audible warning that he was running toward a signal at danger and needed to start slowing down. Failure to press the AWS cancellation button to acknowledge the warning would have also caused the emergency brakes to apply. Automatic train protection, or ATP, would have also certainly prevented the accident. The train was fitted with ATP, but this was switched off. The equipment, both at trackside and in the power car, were fully operational, 
but was not switched on because neither drivers were qualified to drive with ATP, including driver Harrison, who was the driver at the time of the wreck. The signalman was also unaware that the automatic warning system, which warns drivers of adverse signals, had been turned off in the cab of the 125, and had set a route which would stop the express and allow the freight training to cross in front of it. If he had known, he would have prevented from setting a conflicting route under the operational rules and allowed the express to proceed and hold the freight instead. The action of the signaler stopping the high-speed train to allow the slow freight to cross in front of it had been criticized, however, apparently this is standard procedure when regulating trains to minimize overall delay. There was no reason for the signaler to expect that the high-speed train would not stop at the red signal protecting the crossover. At the time, there was no requirement for the signal to have been informed that the high-speed train was in service had its AWS isolated. The rule book, however, was altered to cover this. Following this accident and the later Paddington collision on October 5, 1999, First Great Western required all, all its trains to have ATP switched on no matter what. If the equipment is faulty, the train is taken out of service. It emerged after the incident that the reset switch of the warning system had contamination on its electrical contact surfaces which rendered its performance intermittent, hence its disabling at Oxford the day before the crash. Power car 43173, two passenger cars, and a couple hoppers were scrapped while the rest returned to service. 22 years have passed since the accident, and it's fair to say many important lessons were learned on that fateful day.